Chapter 19 of She and Alan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. She and Alan by H. Rider Haggard. Chapter 19 The Spell. Of our return to Kor I need say nothing, except that in due course we reached that interesting ruin. The journey was chiefly remarkable for one thing, that on this occasion, I imagine for the first and last time in his life, Umslopogaas consented to be carried in a litter, at least for part of the way. He was, as I have said, unwounded for the axe of his mighty foe had never once so much as touched his skin. What he suffered from was shock, a kind of collapse, since although few would have thought it, this great and utterly fearless warrior was at bottom a nervous, highly strung man. It is only the nervous that climb the highest points of anything, and this is true of fights as of all others. That fearful fray with Rezu had been a great strain on the Zulu. As he put it himself, The wizard has sucked the strength out of him, especially when he found that, owing to his armor, he could not harm him in front, and owing to his cunning could not get at him behind. Then it was that he conceived the desperate expedient of leaping over his head and smiting backwards as he leapt a trick he told me that he had once played years before when he was young in order to break a shield ring and reach one who stood in the center in this great leap over rezu's head umslopogaas knew that he must succeed or be slain which in turn would mean my death and that of the others for this reason he faced the shame of seeming to fly in order to gain the high ground whence alone he could gather the speed necessary to such a terrific spring. Well, he made it, and thereby conquered, and this was the end. But as he said, it had left him weak as a snake when it crawls out of his hole into the sun after the long winter sleep. Of one thing, Umslopogas added, he was thankful, namely that Rezu had never succeeded in getting his arms round him, since he was quite certain that if he had, he would have broken him, as a baboon breaks a mealy stalk. No strength, not even his, could have resisted the iron might of that huge gorilla-like man. I agreed with him, who had noted Rezu's vast chest and swelling muscles, also the weight of the blows that had struck with a steel-shafted axe, which, by the way, when I sought for it, was missing, stolen, I suppose, by one of the Amahagger. Whence did that strength come, I wondered, in one who from his face appeared to be old? Was there perchance, after all, some truth in the legend of Samson, and did it well in that gigantic beard and those long locks of his? It was impossible to say, and probably the man was but a Herculean freak, for that he was as strong as Hercules, all the stories that I heard afterwards of his feats left little room for doubt. About one thing only was I certain in connection with him, namely, that the tales of his supernatural abilities were the merest humbug. He was simply one of the representatives of the family of strong men, of whom examples are still to be seen doing marvellous feats all over the earth. For the rest, he was dead and broken up by those Amahagger bloodhounds before I could examine him, or his body armour either, and there was an end of him and his story. But when I looked at the corpse of poor Robertson, which I did as we buried it where he fell, and saw that though so large and sick that it was cleft almost in two by a single blow of Rezu's axe. I came to understand what the might of this savage 
must have been. I say savage, but I am not sure that this is a right description of Rezu. Evidently he had a religion of a sort, also imagination, as was shown by the theft of the white woman to be his queen, by his failing of her to resemble Asha, whom he dreaded, by the intended propitiatory sacrifice, by the god of women sworn to her service, who slew the priest that tried to kill her, and afterwards committed suicide when they had failed in their office, and by other things. All this indicated something more than savagery, perhaps survivals from a forgotten civilization, or perhaps native ability on the part of an individual ruler. I do not know, and it matters nothing. Rezu is dead, and the world is well rid of him, and those who want to learn more of his people can go to study such as remain of them in their own habitat which, for my part, I never wished to visit any more. During our journey to Kor, poor Enis never stirred. Whenever I went to look at her in the litter, I found her lying there with her eyes open and a fixed stare upon her face, which frightened me very much, since I began to fear lest she should die. However, I could do nothing to help her, except urge the bears to top speed. So swiftly did we travel down the hill and across the plain that we reached Kor just as the sun was setting. As we crossed the moat I perceived old Bilali coming to meet us. This he did with many bows, keeping an anxious eye upon the litter which he had learned contained Umslopogas. Indeed his attitude and that of the Amahagger towards the two of us, and even Hans, thenceforward became almost abject since after our victory over rezu and his death beneath the axe they looked upon us as half divine and treated us accordingly o oh, mighty general he said she who commands bids me conduct the lady who is sick to the place that has been made ready for her which is near your own so that you may watch over her if you will i wondered how asha knew that enis was sick but being too tired to ask questions, merely bade him lead on. This he did, taking us to another ruined house next to our own quarters, which had been swept, cleaned, and furnished after a fashion, and moreover cleverly roofed in with mats, so that it was really quite comfortable. Here we found two middle-aged women of a very superior type, who Bilali informed me were by trade nurses of the sick. Having seen her laid upon her bed, I committed Enis to their charge, since the case was not one that I dared to try to doctor myself. Not knowing what drug of the few I possessed should be administered to her, moreover Bilali comforted me with the information that soon she who commands would visit her and make her well again, as she could do. I answered that I hoped so, and went to our quarters where I found an excellent meal ready cooked, and with it a stone flagon, of the contents of which Bilali said we were all three to drink by the command of Asha, who declared that it would take away our weariness. I tried the stuff, which was pale yellow in color, like sherry, and for aught I knew might be poison, to find it most comforting, though it did not seem to be very strong to the taste. Certainly, too, its effects were wonderful, since presently all my great weariness fell from me like a discarded cloak, and I found myself with a splendid appetite and feeling better and stronger than I had done for years. In short, that drink was a cocktail of the best, one of which I only wish I possessed the recipe, though Asha told me afterwards that it was distilled from quite harmless herbs and not in any sense a spirit. Having discovered this, I gave some of it to Hans, also to Umslopogas, who was with the wounded Zulus, who, we found, were progressing well towards complete recovery, and lastly to Goroko, who also was worn out. On all of these the effect of that magical brew proved most satisfactory. Then, having washed, I ate a splendid dinner, 
though in this respect Hans, who was seated on the ground nearby, far outpassed my finest efforts. Baas, he said, things have gone very well with us when they might have gone very ill. The Baas Redbeard is dead, which is a good thing, since a madman would have been difficult to look after, and a brain full of moonshine is a bad companion for anyone. Oh, without doubt, he's better dead, though your reverend father, the predicant, will have a hard job looking after him there in the place of fires. Perhaps, I said with a sigh, since it is better to be dead than to live a lunatic. But what I fear is that the lady, his daughter, will follow him. Oh, no, Baas, replied Hans cheerfully though I dare say that she will always be a little mad also, because, you see, it, it is in her blood, and doubtless she has looked on dreadful things. But the great medicine will see to it that she does not die after we have taken so much trouble and gone into such big dangers to save her. That great medicine is very wonderful, Baas. First of all, it makes you general over those Amahagar who without you would never have fought, as the witch who ties up her head in a cloth knew well enough. Then it brings us safe through the battle, and gives strength to Umslopogas to kill the old man-eating giant. Why did it not give me strength to kill him, Hans? I let him have two express bullets on his chest, which hurt him no more than a tap upon the horns with a dancing stick would hurt a bull the buffalo. Oh, Baas, perhaps you missed him, who because you hit things sometimes think that you do so always. Having waited to see if I would rise to this piece of insolence, which of course I did not, he went on by way of letting me down easily. Or perhaps he wore very good armor under his beard for I saw some of those Amahagar who pulled his hair off and cut him to pieces go away with what looked like little bits of brass. Also, the great medicine meant that he should be killed by Umslopogas and not by you, since otherwise Umslopogas would have been sad for the rest of his life, whereas now he will walk about the world as proud as a cock with two tails and crow all night as well as all day. Then, Baas, when Risa broke the square and the Amahagar began to run, without doubt it was the great medicine which changed their hearts and made them brave again, so that they charged at the right moment when they saw it going forward on your breast, and instead of being eaten up, ate up the cannibals. Indeed, I thought that the lady who dwells yonder had something to do with that business. Did you see her, Hans? Oh, yes, I saw her, Baas, and I think that without doubt she lifted the cloth from over her head, and when the people of Rezo saw how ugly was the face beneath, it did frighten them a little. But doubtless the great medicine put that thought into her also, for, Baas, what could a silly woman do in such a case? Did you ever know of a woman who was of any use in a battle, or for anything else except to nurse babies? And this one does not even do that. No doubt, because being so hideous under that sheet, no man can be found to marry her. Now I looked up by chance, and in the light of the lamp saw Asha standing in the room, which she had entered through the open doorway, within six feet of Hans back indeed. Be sure, Baas, he went on, that this bundle of rags is nothing but a common old cheat who frightens people by pretending to be a spook. As if she dared to say that it was she who made those stinking Amahaga charge, and not the great medicine of the opener of the roads, I would tell her to her face. Now I was too paralyzed to speak, and while I was reflecting that it was fortunate Asha did not understand Dutch, she moved a little so that one of the lamps behind her caused her shadow to fall on the back of the squatting hands, 
and over it on to the floor beyond. He saw it and stared at the distorted shape of the hooded head, then slowly screwed his neck round and looked upwards behind him. For a moment he went on staring as though he were frozen. Then, uttering a wild yell, he scrambled to his feet, bolted out of the house, and vanished into the night. "'It seems, Alan,' said Asha slowly, "'that yonder yellow ape of yours is very bold at throwing sticks when the leopardess is not beneath the tree. But when she comes it is otherwise with him.' Oh, make no excuse, for I know well that he was speaking ill things of me, because, being curious as apes are, he burns to learn what is behind my veil, and, being simple, believes that no woman would hide her face unless its fashion were not pleasing to the nice taste of men. Then, to my relief, she laughed a little, softly, which showed me that she had a sense of humour, and went on. Well, let him be, for he is a good ape, and courageous in his fashion, as he showed when he went out to spy upon the host of Rezo, and stabbed the murdered priest by the stone of sacrifice. How can you know the words of Hans, Asha? I asked seeing that he spoke in a tongue which you have never learnt. Perhaps I read faces, Alan. Or backs, I suggested, remembering that his was turned to her. Or backs, or voices, or hearts. It matters little which, since read I do. But have done with such childish talk, and lead me to this maiden who has been snatched from the claws of Rezo, and a fate that is worse than death. Do you understand, Alan, that ere the demon Reza took her to wife, the plan was to sacrifice her own father to her, and then eat him as the woman with her was eaten, and before her eyes? Now the father is dead, which is well, as I think the little yellow man said to you. Nay, start not, I read it from his back. Ha, Jaby, since had he lived, whose brain was rotted, he would have raved till his death day. Better, therefore, that he should die like a man fighting against a foe unconquerable by all save one. But she still lives. Aye, but mindless, Asha. Which, in a great trouble such as she has passed, is a blessed state. O oh, Alan, bethink you, have there not been days, ay, and months in your own life when you would have rejoiced to sleep in mindlessness. And should we not perchance be happier, all of us, if like beasts we could not remember, foreknow, and understand? Oh, men talk of heaven, but believe me, the real heaven is one of dreamless sleep, since life and wakefulness, however high their scale, and on whatever star, mean struggle which being so oft mistaken must breed sorrow or remorse that spoils all. Come now. So I preceded her to the next ruined house, where we found Enes lying on the bed, still clothed in her barbaric trappings, although the veil had been drawn off her face. There she lay, wide-eyed and still, while the women watched her. Asha looked at her a while, then said to me, So they tricked her out to be Asha's mock and image, and in time accepted by those barbarians as my very self, and even set the seals of royalty on her. And she pointed to the gold disc stamped with the likeness of the sun. Well, she is a fair maiden, white and gently bred, the first such that I have seen for many an age, nor did she wish this trickery. Moreover, she has taken no hurt. Her soul has sunk deep into the sea of horror, and that is all, when doubtless it can be drawn again. Yet I think it best that for a while she should remember not, lest her brain break, as did her father's. 
and therefore no net of mine shall drag her back to memory. Let that return gently in future days, and then of it not too much, for so shall all this terror become to her a void in which sad shapes move like shadows, and as shadows are soon forgot and gone, no more to be held than dreams by the awakening sense. Stand aside, Alan, and you women, leave us for a while. I obeyed, and the women bowed and went. Then Asha drew up a veil, and knelt down by the bed of Enes, but in such a fashion that I could not see her face, although I admit that I tried to do so. I could see, however, that she set her lips against those of Enes, and as I gathered by her motions, seemed to breathe into her lips. Also she lifted her hands, and placing one of them upon the heart of Enes, for a minute or more swayed the other from side to side above her eyes, pausing at times to touch her upon the forehead with her fingertips. Presently Enes stirred and sat up, whereon Asha took a vessel of milk, which stood upon the floor, and held it to her lips. Enes drank to the last drop, then sank on to the bed again. For a while longer Asha continued her motions of her hands, then let fall her veil and rose. Look, I have laid a spell upon her, she said, beckoning to me to draw near. I did so and perceived that now the eyes of Enes were shut and that she seemed to be plunged in a deep and natural sleep. "'So she will remain for this night and that day which follows,' said Asha. "'And when she wakes, it will be, I think, to believe herself once more a happy child. "'Not until she sees her home again will she find her womanhood, "'and then all this story will be forgotten by her. "'Of her father you must tell her that he died "'when you went out to hunt the river beasts together.' and if she seeks for certain others, that they have gone away. But I think that she will ask little more when she learns that he is dead, since I have laid that command upon her soul. Hypnotic suggestion, thought I to myself, and I only hope to heaven that it will work. Asha seemed to guess what was passing through my mind, for she nodded and said, Have no fear, Alan. For I am what the black axe bearer and the little yellow man called a witch, which means, as you who are instructed now, one who has knowledge of medicine and other things, and who holds a key to some of the mysteries that lie hid in nature. For instance, I suggested, of how to transport yourself into a battle at the right moment, and out of it again, also at the right moment? Yes, Alan since, watching from afar, I saw that those Amahagar curs were about to flee, and that I was needed there to hearten them, and to put fear into the army of Rezo, so I came. But how did you come, Asha? She laughed as she answered. Perhaps I did not come at all. Perhaps you only thought I came. Since I seem to be there, the rest matters nothing. As I still looked unconvinced, she went on. O oh, foolish man, seek not to learn of that which is too high for you. Yet listen, you in your ignorance suppose that the soul dwells within the body, do you not? I answered that I had always been under this impression. Yet, Alan, it is otherwise, for the body dwells within the soul. Like the pearl in an oyster. I suggested. I, in a sense, since the pearl, which to you is beautiful, is to the oyster a sickness and a poison, and so is the body to the soul, whose temple it troubles and defiles, yet round it is the white and holy soul that ever seeks to bring the vile body to its own purity and color, yet oft times fails. Learn, Alan, that flesh and spirit are the deadliest foes joined together by a high decree that they may forget their hate and perfect each other, or failing, be separate to all eternity. 
the spirit going to its own place and the flesh to its corruption. A strange theory, I said. Aye, Alan, and one which is so new to you that never will you understand it. Yet it is true, and I set it out to for this reason. The soul of man, being at liberty and not cooped within his narrow breast, is in touch with that soul of the universe which men know as God, whom they call by many names. Therefore it has all knowledge, and perhaps all power, and at times the body within it, if it be a wise body, can draw from this well of knowledge and abounding power. So at least can I. And now you will understand why I am so good a doctoress, and how I came to appear in the battle, as you said, at the right time, and to leave it when my work was done. Oh, yes, I answered. I quite understand. I thank you much for putting it so plainly. She laughed a little, appreciating my jest, looked at the sleeping Enos, and said, The fair body of this lady dwells in a large soul. I think, though one of a somewhat sombre you, for souls have their colours, Alan, and stain that which is within them, she will never be a happy woman. The black people named her Sad Eyes, I said. Is it so? Well, I name her Sad Heart, though for such often there is joy at last. Meanwhile she will forget. Yes, she will forget the worst, and how narrow was the edge between her and the arms of Rezu. Just the width of the blade of the axe in Kosikas, I answered. But tell me, Asha, why could not that axe cut, and why did my bullets flatten or turn aside when these smote the breast of Rezu? Because his front armor was good, Alan, I suppose, she replied indifferently and on his back he wore none. Then why did you fill my ears with such a different tale about that horrible giant having drunk of a cup of life and all the rest? I asked with irritation. I have forgotten, Alan. Perhaps because the curious such as you are like to hear tales even stranger than their own, which in the days to be may become their own. Therefore you will be wise to believe only what I do, and of what I tell you, nothing. I don't, I exclaimed, exasperated. She laughed again and replied. What need to say to me that which I know already? Yet perhaps in the future it may be different, since often by the alchemy of the mind the fables of our youth are changed into the facts of our age and we become to believe in anything, as your little yellow man believes in some savage named Sikali, and those Amahagar believe in the talisman round your neck, and I, who am the maddest of you all, believe in love and wisdom, and the black warrior Umslopogas believes in the virtue of that great axe of his, rather than in those of his own courage and of the strength that wields it. Fools, every one of us, though perchance I am the greatest fool among them. Now take me to the warrior Umslopogas, whom I would thank, as I thank you, Alan, and the little yellow man, although he jeers at me with his sharp tongue, not knowing that if I were angered with the breath I could cause him to cease to be. Then why did you not choose Rezo to cease to be, and his army also, Asha? It seems that I have done these things through the acts of Umslopogas, and by the help of your generalship, Alan. Why then waste my own strength when yours lay to my hand? Because you had no power over Rezu, Asha, or so you told me. Have I not said that my words are snowflakes, meant to melt and leave no trace, hiding my thoughts as this veil hides my beauty? Yes, as the beauty is beneath the veil, perchance there is truth beneath the words, though not that truth you think. So you are well answered, and for the rest I wonder whether Rezu thought I had no power over him, when yonder on the mountain spur 
he saw me float down upon his companies like a spirit of the night. Well, perhaps some day I shall learn this and many other things. I made no answer, since what was the use of arguing with a woman who told me frankly that all she said was false. So, although I longed to ask her why these Amahagar had such reverence for the talisman that Hans called the Great Medicine, since now I guessed that her first explanations concerning it were quite untrue, I held my tongue. Yet, as we went out of the house, by some coincidence she alluded to this very matter. "'I wish to tell you, Alan,' she said, why it was those Amahaga would not accept you as a general till their eyes had seen that which you wear upon your breast. Their tale of a legend of this very thing seemed that of savages or of their cunning priests, not to be believed by a wise man such as you are, like some others that you have heard in Kor. Yet it has in it a grain of truth, for, as it chanced a little while ago, about a hundred years ago, I think, the old wizard, whose picture is cut upon the wood, came to visit her who held my place before me as a ruler of this tribe. She was very like me, and as I believe, my mother, Alan, because of her repute for wisdom. At that time, I have heard, there was a question of war between the worshippers of Lulala and the grandfather of Rezu. But this Sikali told the people of Lulala that they must not fight the people of Rizu, until in a day to come a white man should visit Kor, and bring with him a piece of wood on which was cut the image of a dwarf like to that of Sikali himself. Then, and not before, they must fight and conquer the people of Rizu. Now this story came down among them, and you who may have thought the first tale magical will understand it in its simplicity. Is it not so? You wise Alan? Oh, yes, I answered, except that I do not see how Sikali can have come here a hundred years ago, since men do not live as long, although he pretends to have done so. No, Alan, nor do I, but perhaps it was his father or his grandfather who came, since being observant you will have noted that if the parent is misformed, so often are the descendants also that the pretense of wizardry at times comes down with the blood. Again I made no answer, for I saw that Asha was fooling me, and before she could exhaust that amusement we reached the place where Umslopogaas and his men were gathered round a campfire. He sat silent, but Goroko, with much animation, was telling the story of the fight in picturesque and colourful language, or that part of it which he had seen for the benefit of the two wounded men who took no share in it, and who, lying on their blankets with their heads thrust forwards, were listening with eagerness to the entrancing tale. Suddenly they caught sight of Asha, and those of the party who could stand sprang to their feet, while one and all they gave her the royal salute of Bayete. She waited till the sound had died away, then she said, I come to thank you and your men, O wielder of the axe, who have shown yourself very great in battle, and to say to you that my spirit tells me that every one of you, yes, even those who are still sick, will come safe to your own land again, and live out your years with honour. Again they saluted at this pleasing intelligence, when I had translated it to them for, of course, they knew no Arabic. Then she went on. I am told, Umslopogas, son of the lion, as a certain king was named in your land, that the fight you made against Rezu was a very great fight, and that such a leap as yours above his head when you smote him with the axe on the hinder parts were where he wore no armour and brought him to his death has not been seen before, nor will be again. I rendered the words, and Umslopogas, preferring truth to modesty, replied emphatically that this was the case. Because of that fight and that leap, Asha went on, as for other deeds that you have done and will do, 
My spirit tells me that your name will live in story for many generations, yet of what use is fame to the dead? Therefore I make you an offer. Bide here with me, and you shall rule these Amahagar, and with them the remnant of the people of Rezu. Your cattle shall be countless, and your wives the fairest in the land, and your children many, for I will lift a certain curse from off you, so that no more shall you be childless. Do you accept, O holder of the axe? When he understood, Umslopogaas, after pondering a moment, asked if I meant to stay in this land and marry the white chieftainess, who spoke such wise words, and could appear and disappear in the battle at her will, and like a mountain top hid her head in a cloud, which was his way of alluding to her veil. I answered at once, and with decision, that I intended to do nothing of the sort, and immediately regretted my words, since although I spoke in Sulu, I suppose she read their meaning from my face. At any rate she understood the drift of them. "'Tell him, Alan,' she said with a kind of icy politeness, that you will not stop here and marry me, because if I ever choose a husband he would not be a little man at the doors of whose heart so many women's hands have knocked, yes, even those that are black, and not, I think, in vain. One, moreover, who holds himself so clever that he believes he has nothing left to learn, and in every flower of truth that is shown to him however fair, smells only poison, and beneath, nurturing it, sees only the gross root of falsehood planted in corruption. Tell him these things, Alan, if it pleases you. It does not please me, I answered in a rage at her insults. Nor is it needful, Alan, since if I caught the meaning of that barbarous tongue you use aright, you have told him already. Well, let the jest pass. O oh, man, who least of all things desires to be Asha's husband, and whom Asha, least of all things desires as her spouse, and ask the axe-bearer nothing, since I perceive that without you he will not stay at Kor, nor indeed is it fated that he should do so, for now my spirit tells me what it hid from me when I spoke a moment gone, that this warrior shall die in a great fight far away and that between then and now much sorrow waits him, who, save that a one, knows not how to win the love of women. Let him say, moreover, what reward he desires, since if I can give it to him, it shall be his. Again I translated. Umslopogas received her prophecies in stoical silence, and as I thought with indifference, and only said in reply, the glory that I have won is my reward, and the only boon I seek at this queen's hands is that, if she can, she should give me the sight of a woman for whom my heart is hungry, and with it knowledge that this woman lives in that land whither I travel like all men. When she heard these words, Asha said, True. I had forgotten. Your heart also is hungry, I think, Alan, for the vision of sundry faces that you see no more. Well, I will do my best, but since only faith fulfills itself, how can I, who must strive to pierce the gates of darkness for one so unbelieving, know that they will open at my word? Come to me, both of you at the sunset to-morrow. Then, as though to change the subject, she talked to me for a long while about Kor, of which she told me a most interesting history, true or false, that I omit here. At length, as though suddenly she had grown tired, waving her hand to show that the conversation was ended, Asha went to the wounded men and touched them each in turn. Now they will recover swiftly, she said, and leaving the place was gone into the darkness. End of chapter 19 of She and Alan by H. Ryder Haggard Read by Lars Rolander
Liberty of She and Alan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. She and Alan by H. Rider Haggard. Chapter 20 The Gate of Death. Before turning in, I examined these wounded men for myself. The truth is that I was anxious to learn their exact condition in order that I might take an estimate as to when it would be possible for us to leave this valley or crater bottom of Kor, of which I was heartily tired. Who could desire to stay in a place where he had not only been involved in a deal of hard, doubtful, and very dangerous fighting, from which all personal interest was absent, but where also he was meshed in a perfect spider's web of bewilderment and exposed to continual insult into the bargain. For that is what it came to. This Asha took every opportunity to jeer at and affront me. And why? Just because I had conceived doubts, which somehow she discovered, of the amazing tales with which it had amused her to stuff me as a farmer's wife does a turkey poult with meal pellets. How could she expect me, a man, after all of some experience, to believe such lies, which, not half an hour before, in the coolest possible fashion, she had herself admitted to be lies and nothing else, told for the mere pleasure of romancing? The immortal Rezu, for instance, who had drunk of the cup of life for some such rubbish, now turned out to be nothing but a brawny savage descended from generations of chiefs, also called Rezu. Moreover, the immemorial Asha, who also had drunk of cups of life, and, according to her first story, had lived in this place for thousands of years, had come here with a mother, who filled the same mystic role before her, for the benefit of an extremely gloomy and disagreeable tribe of Semitic savages. Yet she was cross with me, because I had not swallowed her crude and indigestible mixture of fable and philosophy without a moment's question. At least I supposed that this was the reason, though another possible explanation did come into my mind. I had refused to be duly overcome by her charms, not because I was unimpressed, for who could be, having looked upon that blinding beauty even for a moment, but rather because, after sundry experiences, I had at last attained to some power of judgment and learnt what it is best to leave alone. Perhaps this had annoyed her, especially as no white man seemed to have come her way for a long while, and the fabulous Callicrates had not put in his promised appearance. Also, it was unfortunate that in one way or another, how did she do it, I wondered, she had interpreted Umslopoga's question to me about marrying her, and my compromising reply. Not that for one moment, as I saw very clearly, did she wish to marry me, but that fact, intuition suggested to my mind, did not the least prevent her from being angry, because I shared her views upon this important subject. Oh, the whole thing was a bore, and the sooner I saw the last of that veiled lady, and the interesting but wearisome ruins in which she dwelt, the better I should be pleased. Although apparently I must trek homewards with a poor young woman, who was out of her mind, leaving the bones of her unfortunate father behind me, I admitted to myself, however, that there were consolations in the fact that Providence had thus decreed. For Robertson, since he gave up drink, had not been a cheerful companion, and two mad people would really have been more than I could manage. To return, for these reasons I examined the two wounded Zulus with considerable anxiety, only to discover another instance of the chickenery which it amused this Asha to play off upon me. For what did I find? That they were practically well. Their hurts, which had never been serious, had healed wonderfully in that pure air, 
as those of savages have a way of doing, and they told me themselves that they felt quite strong again. Yet, with colossal impudence, Asha had managed to suggest to my mind that she was going to work some remarkable cure upon them, who were already cured. Well, it was of a piece with the rest of her conduct, and there was nothing to do except go to bed, which I did with much gratitude that my resting place that night was not of another sort. The last thing I remember was wondering how on earth Asha appeared and disappeared in the course of that battle, a problem as to which I could find no solution, though, as in the case of the others, I was sure that one would occur to me in course of time. I slept like a top, so soundly indeed, that I think there was some kind of soporific in the pick-me-up which looked like sherry, especially as the others who had drunk of it also passed an excellent night. About ten o'clock on the following morning I awoke, feeling particularly well and quite as though I had been enjoying a week at the seaside instead of my recent adventures, which included an abominable battle and some agonizing moments during which I thought that my number was up upon the board of destiny. I spent the most of that day longing about, eating, talking over the details of the battle with Umslopogas and the Zulus, and smoking more than usual. I forgot to say that these Amahagas grew some capital tobacco, of which I had obtained a supply, although, like most Africans, they only used it in the shape of snuff. The truth was that after all my marvellings and acute anxieties, also mental and physical exertions, I felt like the housemaid who caused to be cut upon her tombstone that she had gone to a better land where her ambition was to do nothing for ever and ever. I just wanted to be completely idle and vacuous-minded for at least a month. But as I knew that all I could expect in that line was a single bank holiday, like a city clerk on the spree. Of it I determined to make the most. The result was that before the evening I felt very bored indeed. I had gone to look at Enis, who was still fast asleep, as Asha said would be the case, but whose features seemed to have plumped up considerably. The reason of this I gathered from her Amahagar nurses, was that, at certain intervals, she had awakened sufficiently to swallow considerable quantities of milk, or rather cream, which I hoped would not make her ill. I had chatted with the wounded Zulus, who were now walking about, more bored even than I was myself, and heaping maledictions on their ancestral spirits, because they had not been well enough to take part in the battle against Riesu. I even took a little stroll to look for Hans, who had vanished in his mysterious fashion, but the afternoon was so hot and oppressive with coming thunder that soon I came back again and fell into a variety of reflections that I need not detail. While I was thus engaged and meditating, not without uneasiness, upon the ordeal that lay before me after sunset, for I felt sure that it would be an ordeal, Hans appeared and said that the Amahagar, Impi, or army, was gathered on that spot where I had been elected to the proud position of their general. He added that he believed, how he got this information I do not know, that the white lady was going to hold a review of them and give them the rewards that they had earned in the battle. Hearing this, Umslopogas and the other Zulus said that they would like to see this review if I would accompany them. Although I did not want to go, nor indeed desired ever to look at another Amahagger, I consented to save the trouble of argument, on condition that we should do so from a distance. So, including the wounded men, we strolled off and presently came to the crumbled wall of the old city, beyond which lay the great moat, now dry, that once had encircled it with water. Here, on the top of this wall, we sat down where we could see without being seen, and observed the Amahagar companies, considerably reduced during the battle, 
being marshalled by their captains beneath us and about a couple of hundred yards away. Also we observed several groups of men under guard. These we took to be prisoners captured in the fight with Rezu, who, as Hans remarked with a smack of his lips, were probably awaiting sacrifice. I said I hoped not, and yawned, for really the afternoon was intensely hot, and the weather most peculiar. The sun had vanished behind clouds, and vapors filled the still air, so dense that at times it grew almost dark. Also, when these cleared for brief intervals, the landscape in the gray, unholy light looked distorted and unnatural, as it does during an eclipse of the sun. Goroko, the witch-doctor, stared round him, sniffed the air, and then remarked jocularly that it was wizard's weather, and that there were many spirits about. Upon my word, I felt inclined to agree with him, for my feelings were very uncomfortable. But I only replied that if so, I should be obliged if he, as a professional, would be good enough to keep them off me. Of course, I knew that electrical charges were about, which accounted for my sensations, and wished that I had never left the camp. It was during one of these periods of dense gloom that Asha must have arrived upon the review ground. At least, when it lifted, there she was in her white garments, surrounded by women and guards, engaged apparently in making an oration, for although I could not hear a word, I could see by the motions of her arms that she was speaking. Had she been the central figure in some stage scene, no limelights could have set her off to better advantage than did those of the heaven above her. Suddenly, through the blanket of cloud, flowing from a hole that looked like an eye, came a blood-red ray which fell full upon her, so that she alone was fiercely visible, whilst all around was gloom, in which shapes moved dimly. Certainly she looked strange and even terrifying in that red ray which stained her robe, till I, who had but just come out of the battle with its confused noise, began to think of the garments rolled in blood, of which I often read in my favorite Old Testament. For crimson was she, from head to foot, a tall shape of terror and of wrath. The eye in heaven shut, and the ray went out. Then came one of the spaces of grey light, and in it I saw men being brought up, apparently from the groups of prisoners under guard, and, to the number of a dozen or more, stood in a line before Asham. Then I saw nothing more for a long while, because blackness seemed to flow in from every quarter of the heavens, and to block out the scene beneath. At least after a pause of perhaps five minutes, during which the stillness was intense, the storm broke. It was a very curious storm. In all my experience of African tempests, I cannot recall one which it resembled. It began with the usual cold and wailing wind. This died away, and suddenly the whole arch of heaven was alive with little lightnings that seemed to strike horizontally, not downwards to the earth weaving a web of fire upon the surface of the sky. By the illumination of these lightnings, which, but for the swiftness of their flashing and greater intensity, somewhat resembled a dense shower of shooting stars, I perceived that Asha was addressing the men that had been brought before her, who stood dejectedly in a long line with their heads bent, quite unattended, since their guards had fallen back. If I were going to receive a reward of cattle or wives, I should look happier than those moon worshippers, Baas, remarked Hans reflectively. Perhaps it would depend, I answered, upon what the cattle and wives were like. If the cattle had red water and would bring disease into your herd, or wild bulls that would gore you, and the wives were skinny old widows with evil tongues, 
Then I think you would look as do those men, Hans. I don't quite know what made me speak thus, but I believe it was some sense of pending death or disaster, suggested probably by the ominous character of the setting provided by nature to the curious drama of which we were witnesses. I never thought of that, Baas, commented Hans, but it is true that all gifts are not good, especially witches' gifts. As he spoke, the little net-like lightnings died away, leaving behind them a gross darkness, through which, far above us, the wind wailed again. Then suddenly all the heaven was turned into one blaze of light, and by it I saw Asha standing tall and rigid, with her hand pointed towards the line of men in front of her. The blaze went out, to be followed by blackness, and to return almost instantly in a yet fiercer blaze, which seemed to fall earthwards in a torrent of fire, that concentrated itself in a kind of flame spout upon the spot where Asha stood. Through that flame, or rather in the heart of it, I saw Asha and the file of men in front of her as the great king saw the prophets in the midst of the furnace that had been heated sevenfold. Only these men did not walk about in the fire. No, they fell backwards, while Asha alone remained upon her feet with outstretched hand. Next came more blackness, and crash upon crash of such thunder that the earth shook as it reverberated from the mountain cliffs. Never in my life did I hear such fearful thunder. It frightened the Zulus so much that they fell upon their faces, except Goroko and Umslopogas, whose pride kept them upon their feet, the former because he had a reputation to preserve as heaven heard, or master of tempests. I confess that I should have liked to follow their example and lie down, being dreadfully afraid lest the lightning should strike me, but there I did not. At last the thunder died away, and in the most mysterious fashion that violent tempest came to a sudden end, as does a storm upon the stage. No rain fell, which in itself was surprising enough and most unusual, but in place of it a garment of the completest calm descended upon the earth. By degrees, too, the darkness passed, and the westering sun reappeared. Its rays fell upon the place where the Amahaga companies had stood, but now not one of them was to be seen. They were all gone, and Asha with them. So completely had they vanished away that I should have thought that we suffered from illusions, were it not for the line of dead men which lay there looking very small and lonesome on the veld mere dots indeed at the distance. We stared at each other and at them, and then Goroko said that he would like to inspect the bodies to learn whether lightning killed at Kor as it did elsewhere, also whether it had smitten them altogether or leapt from man to man. This, as a professional heaven heard, he declared he could tell from the marks upon these unfortunates. As I was curious also, and wanted to make a few observations, I consented. So, with the exception of the wounded men, who I thought should avoid the exertion, we scrambled down the debris of the tumbled wall and across the open space beyond, reaching the scene of the tragedy, without meeting or seeing anyone. There lay the dead, eleven of them, in an exact line as they had stood. They were all upon their backs, with widely opened eyes, and an expression of great fear frozen upon their faces. Some of these I recognized, as did Umslopogas and Hans. They were soldiers or captains who had marched under me to attack Rezo, although until this moment I had not seen any of them after we began to descend the ridge where the battle took place. Pass, said Hans. I believe that these were the traitors who slipped away and told Rezo of our plans, so that he attacked us on the ridge instead of our attacking him on the plain as we had arranged so nicely. At least 
they were none of them in the battle, and afterwards I heard the Amahagger talking of some of them. I remarked that if so, the lightning had discriminated very well in this instance. Meanwhile, Goroko was examining the bodies one by one, and presently called out, These doomed ones died not by lightning, but by witchcraft. There is not a burn upon one of them, nor are their garments scorched. I went to look and found that it was perfectly true. To all outward appearance, the eleven were quite unmarked and unharmed. Except for their frightened air, they might have died a natural death in their sleep. Does lightning always scorch? I asked Goroko. Always, Makamasan, he answered. That is, if he who has been struck is killed as these are, and not only stunned. Moreover, most of yonder dead wear knives, which should have melted or shattered with the sheaths burnt off them. Yet those knives are as though they had just left the smith's hammer and the weth stone. And he drew some of them to show me. Again it was quite true and here I may remark that my experience tallied with that of Goroko, since I have never seen anyone killed by lightning on whom or on whose clothing there was not some trace of its passage. Oh, said Umslopogas, this is witchcraft, not heaven wrath. The place is enchanted. Let us get a whale, lest we be smitten also, who have not earned doom like those traitors. No need to fear, said Hans, since with us is the great medicine of Sikali, which can tie up the lightning as an old woman does a bundle of sticks. Still I observed that for all his confidence, Hans himself was the first to depart, and with considerable speed. So we went back to our camp without more conversation, since the Zulus were scared, and I confess that myself I could not understand the matter, though no doubt it admitted of some quite simple explanation. However that might be, this core was a queer place with its legends, its sullen Amahagger and its mysterious queen to whom at times, in spite of my inner conviction to the contrary, I was still inclined to attribute powers beyond those that are common even among very beautiful and able women. This reflection reminded me that she had promised us a further exhibition of those powers, and within an hour or two. Remembering this, I began to regret that I had ever asked for any such manifestations, for who knew what these might or might not involve. So much did I regret it, that I determined, unless Asha sent for us, as she had said she would do, I would conveniently forget the appointment. Luckily Umslopoga seemed to be of the same way of thinking. At any rate he went off to eat his evening meal without alluding to it at all. So I made up my mind that I would not bring the matter to his notice. And, having ascertained that Inez was still asleep, I followed his example and dined myself, though without any particular appetite. As I finished, the sun was setting in a perfectly clear sky. So, as there was no sign of any messenger, I thought that I would go to bed early, leaving orders that I was not to be disturbed. But on this point my luck was lacking. For just as I had taken off my coat, Hans arrived and said that old Bilali was without and had come to take me somewhere. Well, there was nothing to do but to put it on again. Before I had finished this operation, Bilali himself arrived with undignified and unusual haste. I asked him what was the matter, and he answered, inconsequently that the black one, the slayer of Rezu, was at the door, with his axe. That generally accompanies him, I replied. Then, remembering the cause of Bilali's alarm, I explained to him that he must not take too much notice of a few hasty words, 
spoken by an essentially gentle-natured person whose nerve had given way beneath provocation and bodily effort. The old fellow bowed in assent and stroked his beard, but I noticed that while Umslopogaas was near, he clung to me like a shadow. Perhaps he thought that nervous attacks might be recurrent like those of fever. Outside the house I found Umslopogaas leaning on his axe and looking at the sky in which the last red rays of evening lingered. The sun has set, Magmasan, he said, and it is time to visit this white queen as she bade us and to learn whether she can indeed lead us down below where the dead are said to dwell. So he had not forgotten, which was disconcerting. To cover up my own doubts, I asked him with affected confidence and cheerfulness whether he was not afraid to risk this journey down below, that is, to the realm of death. Why should I fear to tread a road that awaits the feet of all of us, and at the gate of which we knock day by day, especially if we chance to live by war, as do you and I, Makumasan? He inquired with a quiet dignity, which made me feel ashamed. Why, indeed, I answered, adding to myself, though I should much prefer any other highway. After this we started without more words, I keeping up my spirits by reflecting that the whole business was nonsense, and that there could be nothing to dread. All too soon we passed the ruined archway, and were admitted into Asha's presence in the usual fashion. As Bilali, who remained outside of them, drew the curtains behind us, I observed to my astonishment that Hans had sneaked in after me, and squatted down quite close to them, apparently in the hope of being overlooked. It seemed, as I gathered later, that somehow or other he had guessed or become aware of the object of our visit, and that his burning curiosity had overcome his terror of the white witch. Or possibly he hoped to discover whether or not she were so ugly as he supposed her veil-hidden face to be. At any rate, there he was, and if Asha noticed him, as I think she did, for I saw by the motion of her head that she was looking in his direction, she made no remark. For a while she sat still in her chair, contemplating us both. Then she said, How comes it that you are late? Those that seek their lost loves should run with eager feet, but yours have tarried. I muttered some excuse to which she did not trouble to listen, for she went on. I think, Alan, that your sandals, which should be winged like those of the Roman Mercury, are weighted with a grey lead of fear. Well, it is not strange since you have come to travel through the gates of death that are feared by all, even by Asha's self. For who knows what he may find beyond them? Ask the axe-bearer if he also is afraid. I obeyed, rendering all that she had said into the Sulu idiom as best I could. Say to the queen, answered Umslopogas, when he understood, that I fear nothing except women's tongues. I am ready to pass the gates of death, and if need be to come back no more. With the white people I know it is otherwise, because of some dark teachings to which they listen, that tell of terrors to be, such as we who are black do not dread. Still, we believe that there are ghosts and that the spirits of our fathers live on, and, as it chances, I would learn whether this is so, who above all things desire to meet a certain ghost, 
for which reason I journeyed to this far land. Say these things to the White Queen, Macumazahn, and tell her that if she should send me to a place whence there is no return, I, who do not love the world, shall not blame her overmuch, though it is true that I should have chosen to die in war. Now I have spoken. When I had passed on all this speech to Asha, her comment on it was, This black captain has a spirit as brave as his body. But how is it with your spirit, Alan? Are you also prepared to risk so much? Learn that I can promise you nothing, save that when I lose the bonds of your mortality and send out your soul to wander in the depth of death, as I believe that I can do, though even of this I am not certain, you must pass through a gate of terrors that may be closed behind you by a stronger arm than mine. Moreover, what you will find beyond it, I do not know, since, be sure of this, each of us has his own heaven or his own hell, or both, that soon or late he is doomed to travel. Now will you go forward or go back? Make choice while there is still time. At all this ominous talk I felt my heart shrivel like a fire-withered leaf, if I may use that figure, and my blood assume the temperature and consistency of ice-cream. Earnestly did I curse myself for having allowed my curiosity about matters which we are not meant to understand to bring me to the edge of such a choice. Swiftly I determined to temporize which I did by asking Asha whether she would accompany me upon this eerie expedition. She laughed a little as she answered, Bethink you, Alan, am I, whose face you have seen, a meet companion for a man who desires to visit the loves that once were his? What would they say or think? if they should see you hand in hand with such a one? I don't know and don't care, I replied desperately. But this is the kind of journey on which one requires a guide who knows the road. Cannot Umslopogas go first and come back to tell me how it has fared with him? If the brave and instructed white lord panoplied in the world's last faith, is not ashamed to throw the savage in his ignorance out like a feather to test the winds of hell and watch the while to learn whether these blow him back unscorched or waft him into fires whence there is no return perchance it might so be ordered alan ask him yourself alan if he is willing to run this errand for your sake or perhaps the little yellow man. And she paused. At this point, Hans, who having a smattering of Arabic, understood something of our talk, could contain himself no longer. No, Baas, he broke in from his corner by the curtain. Not me. I don't care for hunting spokes, Baas, which leave no spoor that you can follow and are always behind when you think they are in front. Also, there are too many of them waiting for me down there, and how can I stand up to them until I am a spoke myself and know the ways of fighting? Also, if you should die when your spirit is away, I want to be left that I may bury you nicely. Be silent, I said in my sternest manner. Then, unable to bear more of Asha's mockery, for I felt that as usual she was mocking me, I added with all the dignity that I could command. I am ready to make this journey through the gate of death, Asha, if indeed you can show me the road, 
for one purpose and no other I came to Kor, namely to learn, if so I might, whether those who have died upon the world live on elsewhere. Now, what must I do? End of chapter 20 of She and Alan by H. Ryder Haggard Read by Lars Rolander One of She and Alan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. She and Alan by H. Ryder Haggard. Chapter Twenty One. The Lesson. Yes answered Asha, laughing very softly. For that purpose alone, O oh, truth-seeking Alan, whose curiosity is so fierce that the wild world cannot hold it, did you come to Kor, and not to seek wealth or new lands, or to fight more savages? No, not even to look upon a certain Asha, of whom the old wizard told you. Though I think you have always loved to try to lift the veil, that hides women's hearts, if not their faces. Yet it was I who brought you to Kor for my own purposes, not your desire, nor Sikali's map and talisman, since had not the white lady who lies sick been stolen by Rezu, never would you have pursued the journey, nor found the way hither. How could you have anything to do with that business? I asked testily for my nerves were on edge, and I said the first thing that came into my mind. That, Alan, is a question over which you will wonder for a long while, either beneath or beyond the sun, as you will wonder concerning much that has to do with me, which your little mind, shut in its iron box of ignorance and pride, cannot understand today. For example, you have been wondering, I am sure, how the lightning killed those eleven men whose bodies you went to look on an hour or two ago and left the rest untouched well i will tell you at once that it was not lightning that killed them although the strength within me was manifest to you in storm but rather what that which doctor of your following called wizardry because they were traitors who betrayed your army to Rezu. I killed them with my wrath and by the wand of my power. Oh, you do not believe, yet perhaps ere long you will, since thus to fulfill your prayer I must also kill you, almost. That is the trouble, Alan. To kill you outright would be easy, but to kill you just enough to set your spirit free and yet leave one crevice of mortal life through which it can creep back again. That is most difficult, a thing that only I can do, and even of myself I am not sure. Pray, do not try the experiment. I began thoroughly alarmed, but she cut me short. Disturb me no more, Alan, with the tremors and changes of your uncertain mind, lest you should work more evil than you think, and making mine uncertain also, spoil my skill. Nay, do not try to fly, for already the net has thrown itself about you, and you cannot stir, who are bound like a little tilted wasp in the spider's web, or like birds beneath the eyes of basilisks. This was true, for I found that, strive as I would, I could not move a limb or even an eyelid. I was frozen to that spot, and there was nothing for it except to curse my folly and say my prayers. All this while she went on talking, but of what she said I have not the faintest idea, because my remaining wits were absorbed in these much-needed implorations. Presently, of a sudden, I appeared to see Asha seated in a temple, for there were columns about her, and behind her was an altar on which fire burnt. 
All round her, too, were hooded snakes, like to that which she wore about her middle, fashioned in gold. To these snakes she sang, and they danced to her singing. Yes, with flickering tongues they danced upon their tails. What the scene signified I cannot conceive, unless it meant that this mistress of magic was consulting her familiars. Then that vision vanished, and Asha's voice began to seem very far away and dreamy. Also her wondrous beauty became visible to me through her veil, as though I had acquired a new sense that overcame the limitations of mortal sight. Even in this extremity I reflected it was well that the last thing I looked on should be something so glorious. No, not quite the last thing for out of the corners of my eyes I saw that Umslopogaas, from a sitting position, had sunk on to his back and lay, apparently dead, with his axe still gripped tightly and held above his head, as though his arm had been turned to ice. After this terrible things began to happen to me, and I became aware that I was dying. A great wind seemed to catch me up and blow me to and fro, as a leaf is blown in the eddies of a winter gale. Enormous rushes of darkness flowed over me, to be succeeded by vivid bursts of brightness that dazzled like lightning. I fell off precipice, and at the foot of them was caught by some fearful strength, and tossed to the very skies. From those skies I was hurled down again into a kind of whirlpool of inky night round which I spun perpetually as it seemed for hours and hours. But worst of all was the awful loneliness from which I suffered. It seemed to me as though there were no other living thing in all the universe, and never had been and never would be any other living thing. I felt as though I were the universe, rushing solitary through space for ages upon ages in a frantic search for fellowship and finding none. Then something seemed to grip my throat, and I knew that I had died, for the world floated away from beneath me. Now fear and every mortal sensation left me, to be replaced by a new and spiritual terror. I, or rather my disembodied consciousness, seemed to come up for judgment. And the horror of it was that I appeared to be my own judge. There a very embodiment of cold justice, my spirit, grown luminous, sat upon a throne, and to it, with dread and merciless particularity, I set out all my misdeeds. It was as if some part of me remained mortal, for I could see my two eyes, my mouth and my hands, but nothing else. And strange enough they looked. From the eyes came tears, from the mouth flowed words, and the hands were joined as though in prayer to that throned and adamantine spirit which was me. It was as though this spirit were asking how my body had served its purposes, and advanced its mighty ends, and in reply, Oh, what a miserable tale I had to tell! Fault upon fault! weakness upon weakness, sin upon sin. Never before did I understand how black was my record. I tried to relieve the picture with some incidents of attempted good, but that spirit would not hearken. It seemed to say that it had gathered up the good and knew it all. It was of the evil that it would learn, not of the good that had bettered it, but of the evil by which it had been harmed. Hearing this, there rose up in my consciousness some memory of what Asha had said, namely, that the body lived within the temple of the spirit, which is oft defied, and not the spirit in the body. The story was told, and I hearkened for the judgment, my own judgment on myself, which I knew would be accepted without question, and registered for good or ill. But none came since ere the balance sank this way or that, ere it could be uttered, I was swept afar. Through infinity I was swept, and as I fled faster than the light, the meaning of what I had seen came home to me. 
I knew, or seemed to know, for the first time that at the last man must answer to himself, or perhaps to a divine principle within himself, that out of his own free will, through long aeons and by a million steps, he climbs or sinks to the heights or depth dormant in his nature, that from what he was springs what he is, and what he is engenders what he shall be for ever and I. Now I envisaged immortality, and splendid and awful was its face. It clasped me to its breast, and in the vast circle of its arms I was upborn. I, who knew myself to be without beginning and without end, and yet of the past and of the future knew nothing, save that these were full of mysteries. As I went, I encountered others, or overtook them, making the same journey. Robertson swept past me, and spoke, but in a tongue I could not understand. I noted that the madness had left his eyes, and that his fine-cut features were calm and spiritual. The other wanderers I did not know. I came to a region of blinding light. The thought rose in me that I must have reached the sun, or a sun, though I felt no heat. I stood in a lovely shining valley, about which burned mountains of fire. There were huge trees in that valley, but they glowed like gold, and their flowers and fruit were as though they had been fashioned of many-colored flames. The place was glorious beyond compare, but very strange to me, and not to be described. I sat me down upon a boulder, which burned like a ruby, whether with heat or color, I do not know, by the edge of a stream that flowed with what looked like fire and made a lovely music. I stooped down and drank of this water of flames, and the scent and the taste of it were as those of the costliest wine. There, beneath the spreading limbs of a fire tree, I sat and examined the strange flowers that grew around colored like rich jewels, and perfumed above imagining. There were birds also, which might have been feathered with sapphires, rubies, and amethysts, and their song was so sweet that I could have wept to hear it. The scene was wonderful, and filled me with exultation, for I thought of the land where it is promised that there shall be no more night. People began to appear, men, women, and even children, though whence they came I could not see. They did not fly, and they did not walk. They seemed to drift towards me, as unguided boats drift upon the tide. One and all they were very beautiful, but their beauty was not human, although their shapes and faces resembled those of men and women made glorious. None were old, and except the children, none seemed very young. It was as though they had grown backwards or forwards to middle life, and rested there at their very best. Now came the marvel. All these uncounted people were known to me, though so far as my knowledge went I had never set eyes on most of them before. Yet I was aware that in some forgotten life or epoch I had been intimate with every one of them, also that it was the fact of my presence and the call of my subconscious mind which drew them to this spot. Yet that presence and that call were not visible or audible to them, who, I suppose, flowed down some stream of sympathy, why or whither they did not know. Had I been as they were, Perchance they would have seen me. As it was, they saw nothing, and I could not speak and tell them of my presence. Some of this multitude, however, I knew well enough, even when they had departed years and years ago. But about these I noted this, that every one of them was a man or a woman or a child for whom I had felt love or sympathy or friendship. Not one was a person whom I had disliked, or whom I had no wish to see again. If they spoke at all, I could not hear or read their speech. Yet, to a certain extent, I could hear their thoughts. 
Many of these were beyond the power of my appreciation on subjects which I had no knowledge or that were too high for me. But some were of quite simple things such as concern us upon the earth, such as of friendship or learning or journeys made or to be made, or art or literature or the wonders of nature or the fruits of the earth as they knew them in this region. This I noted, too, that each separate thought seemed to be hallowed and enclosed in an atmosphere of prayer or heavenly aspiration, as a seed is enclosed in the heart of a flower, or a fruit in its odorous rind, and that this prayer or aspiration presently appeared to bear the thought away, whither I knew not. Moreover, all these thoughts, even to the humblest things, were beauteous and spiritual. Nothing cruel or impure or even coarse was to be found among them. They radiated charity, purity and goodness. Among them I perceived were none that had to do with our earth. This and its affairs seemed to be left far behind these thinkers. A truth that chilled my soul was alien to their company. Were still, so far as I could discover, although I knew that all these bright ones had been near to me at some hour in the measurements of time and space. Not one of their musings dwelt upon me, or on aught with which I had to do. Between me and them there was a great gulf fixed, and a high wall built. Oh, look! One came shining like a star, and from far away came another, with dove-like eyes, and beautiful exceedingly, and with this last a maiden, whose eyes were as hers, who my own heart told me was her mother. Well, I knew them both. They were those whom I had come to seek, the women who had been mined upon the earth, and at the sight of them my spirit thrilled. Surely they would discover me. Surely at least they would speak of me and feel my presence. But, although they stayed within a pace or two of where I rested, alas, it was not so. They seemed to kiss and to exchange swift thoughts about many things, high things of which I will not write, and common things, yes, even of the shining robes they wore, but never a one of me. I strove to rise and go to them, but could not. I strove to speak and could not. I strove to throw out my thoughts to them and could not. It fell back upon my head like a stone hurled heavenward. They were remote from me, utterly apart. I wept tears of bitterness that I should be so near and yet so far. A dull and jealous rage burned in my heart, and this they did seem to feel, or so I fancied, at any rate, apparently by mutual consent, they moved further from me, as though something pained them. Yes, my love could not reach their perfected natures, but my anger hurt them. As I sat chewing this root of bitterness, a man appeared, a very noble man, in whom I recognized my father grown younger and happier looking, but still my father, with whom came others, men and women whom I knew to be my brothers and sisters who had died in youth far away in Oxfordshire. Joy leapt up in me, for I thought, these will surely know me and give me welcome, since though here sex has lost its power, blood must still call to blood. But it was not so. They spoke or interchanged their thoughts, but not one of me. I read something that passed from my father to them. It was a speculation as to what had brought them all together there, and read also the answer hazarded that perhaps it might be to give welcome to some unknown who was drawing near from below and would feel lonely and unfriended. Thereon my father replied that he did not see or feel this wanderer, and thought that it could not be so, since it was his mission to greet such on their coming. 
Then in an instant all were gone, and that lovely glowing plain was empty, save for myself seated on the ruby-like stone, weeping tears of blood and shame and loss within my soul. So I sat a long while, till presently I was aware of a new presence, a presence dusky and splendid, and arrayed in rich barbaric robes. Straight she came towards me, like a thrown spear, and I knew her for a certain royal and savage woman, who on earth was named Mamina, or Wind that Wailed. Moreover, she divined me, though see me she could not. Art there, watcher in the night, watching in the light, she said or thought. I know not which, but the words came to me in the Zulu tongue. I, she went on, I know that thou art there. From ten thousand leagues away I felt thy presence, and broke from my own place to welcome thee, though I must pay for it with burning chains and bondage. How did those welcome thee whom thou camest out to seek? Did they clasp thee in their arms and press their kisses on thy brow? Or did they shrink away from thee because the smell of earth was on thy hands and lips? I seemed to answer that they did not appear to know that I was there. Ay, they did not know because their love is not enough, because they have grown too fine for love. But I, the sinner, I knew well, and here am I ready to suffer all for thee, and to give thee place with this stormy heart of mine. Forget them, then, and come to rule with me who still am queen in my own house that thou shalt share. There we will live royally, and when our hour comes, at least we shall have had our day. Now, before I could reply, some power seemed to seize this splendid creature and whirl her thence so that she departed, flashing these words from her mind to mine. For a little while, farewell, but remember always that Mamina, the wailing wind, being still a sinful woman in a woman's love and on the earth earthy, found thee whom all the rest forgot. O oh, watcher in the night, Watch in the night for me, for there thou shalt find me, the child of storm, again and yet again. She was gone, and once more I sat in utter solitude upon that ruby stone, staring at the jewelled flowers and the glorious flaming trees and the lambent waters of the brook. What was the meaning of it all, I wondered? And why was I deserted by everyone save a single savage woman? And why had she a power to find me, which was denied to all the rest? Well, she had given me an answer, because she was as a sinful woman with a woman's love, and of the earth earthy, while with the rest it was otherwise. Oh, this was clear that in the heavens man has no friend among the heavenly, save perhaps the greatest friend of all who understands both flesh and spirit. Thus I mused in this burning world which was still so beautiful, this alien world into which I had thrust myself unwanted and unsought. And while I mused this happened, the fiery waters of the stream were disturbed by something, and looking up I saw the cause. A dog had plunged into them, and was swimming towards me. At a glance I knew that dog, on which my eyes had not fallen for decades. It was a mongrel, half spaniel and half bull terrier, which for years had been the dear friend of my youth, and died at last on the horns of a wounded wild beastie that attacked me when I had fallen from my horse upon the veld. Boldly it tackled the maddened buck, thus giving me time to scramble to my rifle and shoot it, but not before the poor hound had yielded its life for mine. Since presently it died disemboweled, but licking my hand and forgetful of its agonies. This dog, Smut by name, 
it was that swam or seemed to swim the brook of fire. It scrambled to the hither shore. It nosed the earth and ran to the ruby stone and started about it, whining and sniffing. At last it seemed to see or feel me, for it stood upon its hind legs and licked my face, yelping with mad joy, as I could see, though I heard nothing. Now I wept in earnest, and bent down to hug and kiss the faithful beast. But this I could not do, since, like myself, it was only shadow. Then suddenly all dissolved in a cataract of many-colored flames, and I fell down into an infinite gulf of blackness. Surely Asha was talking to me. What did she say? What did she say? I could not catch her words, but I caught her laughter and knew that after her fashion she was making a mock of me. My eyelids were dragged down as though with heavy sleep. It was difficult to lift them. At last they were opened, and I saw Asha seated on her couch before me, and, this I noted at once, with her lovely face unveiled. I looked about me, seeking Umslopogas and Hans but they were gone, as I guessed they must be, since otherwise Asha would not have been unveiled. We were quite alone. She was addressing me, and in a new fashion, since now she had abandoned the formal you, and was using the more impressive and intimate thou, much as is the manner of the French. Thou hast made thy journey, Alan, she said, and what thou hast seen there, Thou shalt tell me presently. Yet from thy mien I gather this, that thou art glad to look upon flesh and blood again, and, after the company of spirits, to find that of mortal woman. Come then, and sit beside me, and tell thy tale. Where are the others? I asked as I rose slowly to obey, for my head swam and my feet seemed feeble. Gone, Alan, who, as I think, have had enough ghosts, which is perhaps thy case also. Come, drink this, and be a man once more. Drink it to me, whose skill and power have brought thee safe from lands that human feet were never meant to tread. And, taking a strange-shaped cup from a stool that stood beside her, she offered it to me. I drank to the last drop neither knowing nor caring whether it were wine or poison, since my heart seemed desperate at its failure, and my spirit crushed beneath the weight of its great betrayal. I suppose it was the former, for the contents of that cup ran through my veins like fire, and gave me back my courage and the joy of life. I stepped to the dais and sat me down upon the couch, leaning against its rounded end, so that I was almost face to face with Asha, who had turned towards me, and thence could study her unveiled loveliness. For a while she said nothing, only eyed me up and down, and smiled and smiled, as though she were waiting for that wine to do its work with me. Now that thou art a man again, Alan, Tell me what thou didst see when thou wast more or less than man. So I told her all, for some power within her seemed to draw the truth out of me, nor did the tale appear to cause her much surprise. There is truth in thy dream, she said when I had finished, a lesson also. Then it was all a dream? I interrupted. Is not everything a dream, even life itself, Alan? If so, what can this be that thou hast seen but a dream within a dream, and itself containing other dreams, as in the old days the ball fashioned by the eastern workers of ivory would oft be found to contain another ball, and this yet another, and another, and another, till at the inmost might be found a bead of gold, or perchance a jewel, which was the prize of him who could draw out ball from ball, and leave them all unbroken. 
that search was difficult and rarely was the jewel come by if at all so that some said there was none save in the maker's mind yes i have seen a man go crazed with seeking and die with a mystery unsolved how much harder then is it to come at the diamond of truth which lies in the core of all our nest of dreams and without which to rest upon they could not be fashioned to seem realities but was it really a dream and if so what were the truth and the lesson i asked determined not to allow her to bemuse or escape me with her metaphysical talk and illustrations the first question has been answered alan as well as i can answer who am not the architect of this great globe of dreams and as yet cannot clearly see the ineffable gem within whose prison rays illuminate their substance though so dimly that only those with the insight of a god can catch their glamour in the night of thought since to most they are dark as glow-flies in the glare of noon then what are the truth and the lesson i persisted perceiving that it was hopeless to extract from her an opinion as to the real nature of my experiences and that i must content myself with her deductions from them thou tellest me alan that in thy dream or vision thou didst seem to appear before thyself seated on a throne and in that self to find thy judge that is the truth whereof i spoke though how it found its way through the black and ignorant shell of one whose wit is so small is more than i can guess since i believed that it was revealed to me alone now i alan thought to myself that i began to see the origin of all these fantasies and that for once ayesha had made a slip if she had a theory and i developed that same theory in a hypnotic condition it was not difficult to guess its fount however i kept my mouth shut and luckily for once she did not seem to read my mind perhaps because she was too much occupied in spinning her smooth web of entangling words all men worship their own god she went on and yet seem not to know that this god dwells within them and that of him they are a part. There he dwells, and there they mould him to their own fashion, as the potter moulds his clay, though whatever the shape he seems to take beneath their fingers, still he remains the god infinite and unalterable. Still he is the seeker and the sought, the prayer and its fulfilment, the love and the hate, the virtue and the vice, since all these qualities the alchemy of his spirit turns into an ultimate and eternal good. For the God is in all things, and all things are in the God, whom men clothe with such diverse garments, and whose countenance they hide beneath so many masks. In the tree flows the sap, yet what knows the great tree it nurtures of the sap in the world's womb burns the fire that gives life yet what of the fire knows the glorious earth it conceived and will destroy in the heavens the great globe swings through space and rests not yet what know they of the strength that sent them spinning and in a time to come will stay their mighty motions or turn them to another course therefore of everything this all-present god is judge or rather not one but many judges since of each living creature he makes its own magistrate to deal out justice according to that creature's law which in the beginning the god established for it and decreed Thus, in the breast of every one there is a rule, and by that rule, at work through a countless chain of lives, in the end he shall be lifted up to heaven, 
or bound about and cast down to hell and death. You mean conscience, I suggested rather feebly, for her thoughts and images overpowered me. I, a conscience, if thou wilt, and canst only understand that term, though it fits my theme but ill. This is my meaning, that conscience, as thou namest them, are many. I have one, thou, Alan, hast another, that black axe-bearer has a third, the little yellow man a fourth and so on through the tale of living things. For even a dog, such as thou sawest, has a conscience, and, like thyself or I, must in the end be its own judge, because of the spark that comes to it from above. The same spark which in me burns a great fire, and in thee as a smouldering ember of green wood. When you, sit in judgment on yourself in a day to come, Asha. I could not help interpolating. I trust that you will remember that humility did not shine among your virtues. She smiled in her vivid way. Only twice or thrice did I see her smile thus, and then it was like a flash of summer lightning, illumining a clouded sky, since for the most part her face was grave and even sombre. Well answered, she said. Go the patient ox enough, and even it will grow fierce and paw the ground. Humility! What have I to do with it, O oh, Alan? Let humility be part of the humble-souled and lowly. But for those who reign as I do, and they are few indeed, let there be pride and the glory they have earned. Now I have told thee of the truth thou sawest in thy vision, and wouldst thou hear the lesson? Yes, I answered, since I may as well be done with at once, and doubtless it will be good for me. The lesson, Alan, is one which thou preachest, humility. Vain man and foolish as thou art, thou didst desire to travel the underworld in search of certain ones who once were all in all to thee, nay, not all in all, since of them there were two or more, but at least much. Thus thou wouldst do because, as thou saidest, thou didst seek to know whether they still lived on beyond the gates of blackness. Yes, thou saidest this, but what thou didst hope to learn in truth was whether they lived on in thee and for thee only. For thou, thou in thy vanity, didst picture these departed souls as doing not in that heaven they had won save think of thee still burrowing on the earth and at times lightening thy labours with kisses from other lips than theirs never i exclaimed indignantly never it is not true then i pray pardon alan who only judged of thee by others that were as men are made and being such, not to be blamed if perchance from time to time they turn to look on women who, alas, were as they are made. So at least it was when I knew the world, but mayhap since then its richest wine has turned to water, whereby I hope it has been bettered. At the least this was thy thought, that those women who had been thine for an hour through all eternity could dream of naught else save thy perfections, and hope for naught else than to see thee at their sides through that eternity, or such part of thee as thou couldst spare to each of them, for thou didst forget that where they have gone there may be others even more peerless than thou art, and more fit to hold a woman's love which, as we know on earth, 
was ever changeful, and perhaps may so remain, where it is certain that new lights must shine, and new desires beckon. Dost understand me, Alan? I think so, I answered with a groan. I understand you to mean that worldly impressions soon wear out, and that people who have departed to other spheres may therefore new ties and forget the old. Yes, Alan, as do those who remain upon this earth, whence these others have departed. Do men and women still remarry in the world, Alan, as in my day they were wont to do? Of course, it is allowed. As many other things, or perchance this same thing may be allowed elsewhere. For when there are so many habitations from which to choose, why should we always dwell in one of them, however straight the house or poor the prospect? Now understanding that I was symbolized by the straight house and the poor prospect, I should have grown angry, had not a certain sense of humor come to my rescue, who remembered that after all Asha's satire was profoundly true. Why, beyond the earth, should any one desire to remain unalterably tied to and inextricably wrapped up in such a personality as my own? especially if others of superior texture abounded about them. Now that I came to think of it, the thing was absurd, and not to be the least expected in the midst of a thousand new and vivid interests. I had met with one more disillusionment, that was all. Dost understand, Alan, went on Asha who evidently was determined that I should drink this cup to the last drop, that these dwellers in the sun, or the far planet where thou hast been, according to thy tale, saw thee not and knew not of thee? It may chance, therefore, that at this time thou wast not in their minds, which at others dream of thee continually or it may chance that they never dream of thee at all, having quite forgotten thee, as the weaned cub forgets its mother. At last there was one who seemed to remember, I exclaimed, for her poison mocking stung the words out of me. One woman, and a dog. Ay, the savage who being nature's child, a sinner that departed hence by her own act, how Asha knew this I cannot say. I never told her. Has not yet put on perfection, and therefore still remembers him whose kiss was lost upon her lips. But surely, Alan, it is not thy desire to pass from the gentle, ordered clasping of those white souls for the tumultuous arms of such a one as this. Still, let that be, for who knows what men will or will not do in jealousy and disappointed love. And the dog, it remembered also, and even sought thee out, since dogs are more faithful and single-hearted than is mankind. There at least thou hast thy lesson, namely to grow more humble, and never to think again that thou holdest all a woman's soul for a because once she was kind to thee for a little while on earth. Yes, I answered, jumping up in a rage. As you say, I have my lesson, and more of it than I want. So, by your leave, I will now bid you farewell, hoping that when it comes to be your turn to learn this lesson, or worse, Asha, as I am sure it will one day, for something tells me so, you may enjoy it more than I have done. End of chapter 21 of She and Alan by H. Ryder Haggard Read by Lars Rolander
Fifty-two of She and Alan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. She and Alan by H. Ryder Haggard. Chapter Twenty-Two. Asha's farewell. Thus I spoke, whose nerves were on edge after all I had seen, or, as even then, I suspected seemed to see. For how could I believe that these visions of mine had any higher origin than Asha's rather malicious imagination? Already I had formed my theory. It was that she must be a hypnotist of power, who, after she had put a spell upon her subject, could project into his mind such fancies as she chose together with a selection of her own theories. Only two points remained obscure. The first was, how did she get the necessary information about the private affairs of a humble individual like myself? For these were not known even to Sikali, with whom she seemed to be in some kind of correspondence, or to Hans, at any rate in such completeness. I could but presume that in some mysterious way she drew them from, or rather excited them in my own mind and memory, so that I seemed to see those with whom once I had been intimate, with modifications and in surroundings that her intelligence had carefully prepared. It would not be difficult for a mind like hers, familiar, as I gathered it was, with the ancient lore of the Greeks and the Egyptians, to create a kind of Hades, and, by way of difference, to change it from one of shadow to one of intense illumination, and into it to plunge the consciousness of him upon whom she had laid her charm of sleep. I had seen nothing and heard nothing that she might not thus have moulded, always given that she had access to the needful clay of facts which I alone could furnish. Granting this hypothesis, the second point was what might be the object of her elaborate and most bitter jest. Well, I thought that I could guess. First she wished to show her power, or rather to make me believe that she had power of a very unusual sort. Secondly, she owed Umslopogas and myself a debt for our services in the war with Rezu, which we had been told would be repaid in this way. Thirdly, I had offended her in some fashion, and she took her opportunity of settling the score. Also, there was a fourth possibility, that really she considered herself a moral instructress and desired, as she said, to teach me a lesson by showing how futile were human hopes and vanities in respect to the departed and their affections. Now, I do not pretend that all this analysis of Asha's motives occurred to me at the moment of my interview with her. Indeed, I only completed it later, after much careful thought, when I found it sound and good. At that time, although I had inklings, I was too bewildered to form a just judgment. Further, I was too angry, and it was from this bow of my anger that I loosed a shaft at a venture as to some lesson which awaited her. Perhaps certain words spoken by the dying Rezu had shaped that shaft, or perhaps some shadow of her advancing fate fell upon me. The success of the shot, however, was remarkable. Evidently it pierced the joints of her harness, and indeed went home to Asha's heart. She turned pale. All the peach-blossom hues faded from her lovely face. Her great eyes seemed to lessen and grow dull, and her cheeks to fall in. Indeed, for a moment she looked old, very old, quite an aged woman. 
Moreover, she wept, for I saw two big tears drop upon her white raiment, and I was horrified. "'What has happened to you?' I said, or rather gasped. "'Not,' she answered, "'save that thou hast hurt me sore. "'Dost thou not know, Alan, "'that it is cruel to prophesy ill to any, "'since such words feathered from fate's own wing "'and barbed with venom "'fester in the breast and mayhap bring "'about their own accomplishment? "'Most cruel of all is it "'when with them are repaid friendship and gentleness.' I reflected to myself, yes, friendship of the order that is called candid, and gentleness such as is hid in a cat's velvet paw, but contented myself with asking how it was that she who said she was so powerful came to fear anything at all. Because, as I have told thee, Alan, there is no armor that can turn the spear of destiny which, when I heard those words of thine, it seemed to me, I know not why, was directed by thy hand. Look now on Resu, who thought himself unconquerable, and yet was slain by the black axe-bearer, and whose bones to-night stay the famine of the jackals. Moreover, I am accursed who sought to steal its servant from heaven to be my love. And how know I when and where vengeance will fall at last? Indeed, it has fallen already on me, who, through the long ages, amid savages must mourn widowed and alone. But not all of it. Oh, I think not all. Then she began to weep in good earnest, and watching her, for the first time I understood that this glorious creature, who seemed to be so powerful, was after all one of the most miserable of women, and as much a prey to loneliness, every sort of passion, and apprehensive fear, as can be any common mortal. If, as she said, she had found the secret of life, which of course I did not believe, at least it was obvious that she had lost that of happiness. She sobbed softly and wept, and while she did so, the loveliness which had left her for a little while returned to her like light to a grey and darkened sky. Oh, how beautiful she seemed with the abundant locks in disorder over her tear-stained face! How beautiful, beyond imagining! My heart melted as I studied her. I could think of nothing else except her surpassing charm and glory. I pray you do not weep, I said. It hurts me, and indeed I am sorry if I said anything to give you pain. But she only shook that glorious hair further about her face, and behind its veil wept on. "'You know, Asha, I continued, "'you have said many hard things to me, "'making me the target of your bitter wit. "'Therefore it is not strange that at last I answered you. "'And hast thou not to serve them, Alan?' she murmured in soft and broken tones from behind that veil of scented locks. Why? I asked. Because from the beginning thou didst defy me, showing in thine every accent that thou heldest me a liar, and one of no account in body or in spirit, one not worthy of thy kind look, or of those gentle words which once were my portion among men. Oh, thou hast dealt hardly with me, and therefore, perchance, I know not, I paid thee back with such poor weapons as a woman holds, though all the while I liked thee well. Then again she fell to sobbing, swaying herself gently to and fro in her sweet sorrow. It was too much. 
Not knowing what else to do to comfort her, I patted her ivory hand which lay upon the couch beside me, and as this appeared to have no effect, I kissed it, which she did not seem to resent. Then suddenly I remembered and let it fall. She tossed back her hair from her face, and fixing her big eyes on me, said gently enough, looking down at her hand, What ails thee, Alan? Oh, nothing, I answered. Only I remember the story you told me about some man called Callicrates. She frowned. And what of Callicrates, Alan? Is it not enough that for my sins, with tears, empty longings, and repentance, I must wait for him through all the weary centuries? Must I also wear the change of this Callicrates, to whom I owe many a debt when he is far away? Say, didst thou see him in that heaven of thine, Alan? for there perchance he dwells. I shook my head and tried to think the thing out, while all the time those wonderful eyes of hers seemed to draw the soul from me. It seemed to me that she bent forward and held up her face to me. Then I lost my reason and also bent forward. Yes, she made me mad, and save her I forgot all. Swiftly she placed her hand upon my heart, saying, Stay, what meanst thou? Dost love me, Alan? I think so. That is, yes, I answered. She sank back upon the couch away from me and began to laugh very softly. What words are these, she said, that they pass thy lips so easily? and so unmeant, perchance from long practice. Oh, Alan, I am astonished. Art thou the same man who some few days ago told me, and this unasked, that as soon wouldst thou think of courting the moon as of courting me? Art thou he who not a minute gone swore proudly, that never had his heart and his lips wandered from certain angels whither they should not. And now, and now? I colored to my eyes and rose, muttering, Let me be gone. Nay, Alan, why? I see no mark here. And she held up her hand, scanning it carefully. Thou art too much what thou wert before, except perhaps in thy soul, which is invisible, she added with a touch of malice. Nor am I angry with thee. Indeed, hadst thou not tried to charm away my woe, I should have thought but poorly of thee as a man. There, let it rest and be forgotten, or remembered as thou wilt. Still, in answer to thy words concerning my Callicrates, what of those adored ones that, according to thy tale, but now thou didst find again in a place of light? Because they seemed faithless, shouldst thou be faithless also? Shame on thee, thou fickle Alan. She paused, waiting for me to speak. Well, I could not. I had nothing to say, who was utterly disgraced and overwhelmed. Thou thinkst, Alan, she went on, that I have cast my net about thee, and this is true. Learn wisdom from it, Alan, and never again defy a woman, that is, if she be fair, for then she is stronger than thou art since nature for its own purpose made her so. Whatever I have done by tears, that ancient artifice of my sex, as in other ways, 
is for thy instruction, Alan, that thou mayst benefit thereby. Again I sprang up, uttering an English exclamation, which I trust Asha did not understand, and again she motioned to me to be seated, saying, Nay, leave me not yet, since, even if the light fancy of a man that comes and goes like the evening wind, and for a breath made my dear to thee, has passed away, there remains certain work which we must do together, although, thinking to thyself alone, thou hast forgotten it, having been paid thine own fee. One is yet due to that old wizard in a far land, who sent thee to visit Kor and me, as indeed he has reminded me, and within an hour. This amazing statement aroused me from my personal and painful preoccupation, and caused me to stare at her blankly. Again thou disbelievest me, she said with a little stamp. Do so once more, Alan, and I swear I'll bring thee to grovel on the ground, and kiss my foot and babble nonsense to a woman sworn to another man, such as never for all thy days thou shalt think of without a blush of shame. Oh, no, I broke in hurriedly. I assure you that you are mistaken. I believe every word you have said, or say, or will say, I do in truth. Now thou liest. Well, what is one more falsehood among so many? Let it pass. What indeed? I echoed in eager affirmation. And as for Sikali's message? And I paused. It was to recall to my mind that he desired to learn whether a certain great enterprise of his will succeed the details of which he says thou canst tell me. Repeat them to me. So, glad enough to get away from more dangerous topics, I narrated to her as briefly and clearly as I could the history of the old witch doctor's feud with the royal house of Zululand. She listened, taking in every word, and said, So now he yearns to know whether he will conquer or be conquered, and that is why he sent or thinks that he sent thee on this journey, not for thy sake, Alan, but for his own. I cannot tell thee, for what have I to do with the finish of this petty business, which to him seems so large? Still, as I owe him a debt for luring the axe-bearer here to rid me of mine enemy, and thee to lighten my solitude for an hour by the burnishing of thy mind, I will try. Set that bowl before me, Alan. And she pointed to a marble tree-pod, on which stood a basin half full of water. And come, sit close by me, and look into it, telling me what thou seest. I obeyed her instructions, and presently found myself with my head over the basin, staring into the water in the exact attitude of a person who is about to be shampooed. This seems rather foolish, I said abjectly, for at that moment I resembled the Queen of Sheba in one particular, if in no other, namely that there was no more spirit in me. What am I supposed to do? I see nothing at all. Look again, she said, and as she spoke the water grew clouded. Then on it appeared a picture. I saw the interior of a kaffir hut, dimly lighted by a single candle, set in the neck of a bottle. To the left of the door of the hut was a bedstead, and on it lay stretched a wasted and dying man, in whom, to my astonishment, I recognized Setivayo, king of the Zulus. At the foot of the bed stood another man, myself grown older by many years, and leaning over the bed, apparently whispering into the dying man's ear, was a grotesque and malevolent figure which I knew to be that of Sikali, opener of roads. 
whose glowing eyes were fixed upon the terrified and tortured face of Setevayo. All was as it happened afterwards, as I have written down in the book called Finished. I described what I saw to Asha, and while I was doing so the picture vanished away, so that nothing remained save the clear water in the marble bowl. The story did not seem to interest her. Indeed, she leaned back and yawned a little. Thy vision is good, Alan, she said indifferently, and wide also, since thou canst see what passes in the sun or distant stars and pictures of things to be in the water, to say nothing of other pictures in a woman's eyes, all within an hour. Well, this savage business concerns me not, and of it I want to know no more. Yet it would appear that here the old wizard, who is thy friend, has the answer that he desires. For there in the picture the king he hates lies dying, while he hisses in his ear, and thou dost watch the end. What more can he seek? Tell him it when ye meet, and tell him also it is my will that in future he should trouble me less, since I love not to be wakened from my sleep to listen to his half-instructed talk and savage vaporings. Indeed, he presumes too much. And now enough of him and his dark plots. Ye have your desires, all of you, and are paid in full. Overpaid, perhaps, I said with a sigh. Ah, Alan, I think that lesson thou hast learned pleases thee but little. Well, be comforted, for the thing is common. Hast never heard that there is but one morsel more bitter to the taste than desire denied, namely, desire fulfilled. Believe me that there can be no happiness for man until he attains a land where all desire is dead. That is what the Buddha preaches, Asha. Aye, I remember the doctrines of that wise man well, who without doubt had found a key to the gate of truth, one key only. For, mark thou, Alan, there are many. Man being man must know desires, since without them, robbed of ambitions, strivings, hopes, fears, I, and of life itself, the race must die, which is not the will of the Lord of life, who needs a nursery for his servants' souls, wherein his swords of good and ill shall shape them to his pattern. So it comes about, Alan, that what we think the worst is oft best for us, and with that knowledge, if we are wise, let us assuage our bitterness and wipe away our tears. I have often thought that, I said. I doubt it not, Alan since though it has pleased me to make a jest of thee, I know that thou hast thy share of wisdom, such little share as thou canst gather in thy few short years. I know, too, that thy heart is good and aspires high. And friend, well, I find in thee a friend indeed, as I think not for the first time, nor certainly for the last, Mark, Alan, what I say, not a lover, but a friend, which is higher far. For when passion dies with the passing of the flesh, if there be no friendship, what will remain save certain memories that, mayhap, are well forgot? Eh, how would those lovers meet elsewhere who were never more than lovers? With weariness, I hold as they stared into each other's empty soul, or even with disgust. Therefore, 
the wise will seek to turn those with whom fate mates them into friends since otherwise soon they will be lost for a more if they are wiser still having made them friends they will suffer them to find lovers where they will good maxims are they not yet hard to follow or so perchance thou thinkst them as i do she grew silent and brooded a while resting her chin upon her hand and staring down the hall thus the aspect of her face was different from many that i had seen it wear no longer had it the allure of aphrodite or the majesty of hera rather might it have been that of athene herself so wise it seemed so calm so full of experience and of foresight that almost it frightened me what was this woman's true story i wondered what her real self and what the sum of her gathered knowledge perhaps it was accident or perhaps again she guessed my mind at any rate her next words seemed in some sense an answer to these speculations lifting her eyes she contemplated me a while then said my friend we part to meet no more in thy life's day often thou wilt wonder concerning me as to what in truth i am and mayhap in the end thy judgment will be to write me down some false and beauteous wanderer who rejected of the world or driven from it by her crimes made choice to rule among savages playing the part of oracle to that little audience and telling strange tales to such few travellers as come her way perhaps indeed i do play this part among many others and if so thou wilt not judge me wrongly alan in the old days mariners who had sailed the northern seas told me that there in amidst mist and storm float mountains of ice shed from dizzy cliffs which are hid in darkness where no sun shines they told me also that whereas above the ocean's breast appears but a blue and dazzling point sunk beneath it is oft a whole frozen isle invisible to man such am i alan of my being thou seest but one little peak glittering in light or crowned with storm as heaven's moods sweep over it but in the depth beneath are hid its white and broad foundations hollowed by the seas of time to caverns and to palaces which my spirit doth inhabit so picture me therefore as wise and fair but with a soul unknown and pray that in time to come thou mayst see it in its splendour hadst thou been other than thou art i might have shown thee secrets making clear to thee the parable of much that i have told thee in metaphor and varying fable ay and given thee great gifts of power and enduring days of which thou knowest nothing but of those who visit shrines o alan two things are required worship and faith since without these the oracles are dumb and the healing waters will not flow now i ayesha am a shrine yet to me thou broughtest no worship until i won it by a woman's trick and in me thou hast no faith therefore for thee the oracle will not speak and the waters of deliverance will not flow yet i blame thee not who art as thou wast made and the hard world has shaped thee and so we part think not i am far from thee because thou seest me not in the days to come 
sins like that Isis, whose majesty alone I still exercise on earth. I, whom men name Asha, am in all things. I tell thee that I am not one, but many, and being many, am both here and everywhere. When thou standest beneath the sky at night, and lookest on the stars, remember that in them mine eyes behold thee. When the soft winds of evening blow, that my breath is on thy brow, and when the thunder rolls, that there am I, riding on the lightnings and rushing with the gale. Do you mean that you are the goddess Isis? I asked, bewildered. Because if so, why did you tell me that you were but her priestess? Have it as thou wilt, Alan. All sounds do not reach thine ears. All sights are not open to thy eyes. And therefore thou art half deaf and blind. Perchance now that her shrines are dust and her worship is forgot, some spark of the spirit of that immortal lady whose chariot was the moon lingers on the earth in this woman's shape of mine though her essence dwells afar and perchance her other name is nature my mother and thine o oh, alan at the least hath not the world a soul and of that soul am i not mayhap a part Ay, and thou also, for the rest are not the priest and the divine he bows to of the same. It was on my lips to answer yes, if the priest is a knave or a self-deceiver, but I did not. Farewell, Alan, and let Asha's benison go with thee. Safe shalt thou reach thy home. For all is prepared to take thee hence, and thy companions with thee. Safe shalt thou live for many a year, till thy time comes, and then, perchance, thou wilt find those whom thou hast lost more kind than they seem to be to-night. She paused a while, then added, Hearken unto my last word. As I have said, much that I have told thee may bear a double meaning, as is the way of parables, to be interpreted as thou wilt. Yet one thing is true. I love a certain man, in the old days named Callicrates, to whom alone I am appointed by a divine decree, and I await him here. Oh, shouldst thou find him in the world without, tell him that Asha awaits him, and grows weary in the waiting. Nay, thou wilt never find him, since even if he be born again, by what token would he be known to thee? Therefore I charge thee, keep my secrets well, lest Asha's curse should fall on thee. While thou livest, tell not of me to the world thou knowest. Dost thou swear to keep my secrets, Alan? I swear, Asha. I thank thee, Alan, she answered, and grew silent for a while. At length Asha rose, and drawing herself up to the full of her height, stood there majestic. Next she beckoned to me to come near, for I too had risen and left the days. I obeyed, and bending down she held her hands over me as though in blessing, then pointed towards the curtains, which at this moment were drawn asunder, by whom I do not know. I went, and when I reached them, turned to look my last on her. There she stood as I had left her, but now her eyes were fixed upon the ground, and her face once more was brooding absently, as though no such a man as I had ever been. 
it came into my mind that already she had forgotten me, the plaything of an hour, who had served her turn and been cast aside. End of chapter 22 of She and Alan by H. Ryder Haggard Read by Lars Rolander